Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, Jalal Sabur and Ray Figueroa tell us how they're connecting farming to restorative justice. And fisherman Bren Smith talks about saving the earth and jobs with kelp. All that and a few words from me on giving thanks and growing food power. Welcome to our program. Land and food have been used as a weapon to keep people of color and second-class status for centuries. Can they be used as a tool for justice? Today's guests are using fresh food to rebalance the scales of power and dig up the school-to-prison pipeline. They're Jalal Sabur, the co-founder of the Freedom Food Alliance, a collective of farmers, political prisoners and organizers in upstate New York, and Ray Figueroa Jr. of the Friends of Brook Farm, an alternatives to incarceration program that works with young people affected by the prison system. Welcome to the program, both of you. I, I could see you, you smiling with this uh, land and food as a weapon thing. Yes. You like that, huh? Yes, I very much so. <laughs> uh, food has always been very, very uh, strategic to the struggle for justice, uh, to the struggle for liberation. Um, there's a long history that goes back to uh, the revolution of the 60s. Uh, folks like the Young Lords Party, uh, people like the uh, Black Panther Party actually use food to address the very daily struggle of people just to get by. Um, and the Young Lords Party uh, and Black Panther Party actually started something quite as it's kept known as breakfast programs right. for you mm -hmm. because they realized that the struggle for liberation uh, can only go but so far if young people were not well fed and being able to concentrate in school. So food was uh, actually looked at you know very very strategically even the Black Panther Party used food to do uh, voter registration. Yeah, yeah. Well, the government, the U.S. government, mm -hmm. saw food very strategically, too. Mm -hmm. And you know some of this history, Jalal, but we heard it a lot when we were in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, talking with Hollis Watkins and some of the other veterans of the civil rights movement, how the government withheld agricultural credits mm -hmm. from people mm -hmm. who got involved in the civil rights movement. Talk about that side of the picture for a minute. Yeah, there's a long trauma that you know a lot of black folks have went through in this country just trying to actually provide their, their own liberation for themselves through land and through food and and trying to figure out other ways to actually provide a living for themselves. Um, I One of our, you know, inspirations is Fannie Lou Hamer in, in Mississippi and, you know, people know her for saying, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, but she was, she was also growing food, you know, she had the Freedom Farm Cooperative in Mississippi and they had like a piggy bank where people can bring their pigs to and they like use their resources to actually, you know, slaughter pigs and, and like get their wealth and get their their liberation that they were looking for. And do things together that yeah. they couldn't do individually. What's it got to do with the uh, school to prison pipeline? I think when even going back in our history, like talking to young people, some of the the conversations that we have is about when slavery ended. A lot of a lot of things that were happening during the Jim Crow era was pushing young black people into prison. Because why? Because that was the one loophole in the Emancipation Proclamation was that slavery can continue in prison. And so they would create these laws that would just round up young black folks just for being on the street. The black codes. Yeah, black codes. And so they would put these young people in prison and like have them continue working on a plantation. And what does that look like today? You know, school to prison pipeline, stop and frisk. It's the same thing that's going on today that was going on back then. And so making that connection for young people is very real and they see it and, and they understand it and they want to figure out how we can do something to change it. Describe for a soul fire farm for a minute, because you've been talking mm. sort of what you want to be doing, what you are doing, but really describe it. Like, what's the experience? Uh, are they listening to Malcolm X speeches while they're <laughs> hoeing the fields? I don't know. Um, there's, there's some of that. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of dancing, and it's just spiritual, and sometimes it's like just letting loose and like, and meditating on what, you know, the power of the land, and just talking about how this place is like some, part of our liberation, like what Ray was saying. It's and in so, upstate New York, right? Yeah, so far is in Grafton, New York. Um, it's close to Albany, Troy, Capital Area region. Um, and so a lot of the young people that we get are from Albany that have been going through stop and frisk situations just for like walking on the street. Um, and then they come to the farm and they have that still, you know, connection to farming as slavery. And so we are talking about, this is, this is a different model. We're not talking about slavery. We're talking about gaining our power through land and, and talking about 
you know, just getting their hands dirty and doing something good and positive in the world. And once they see us doing it and like have that connection, they, they get into it. We do the re restorative justice work, but there's also like the black and Latino farmer immersion and mm -hmm. like, you know, the food distribution. And so I, I think the important aspect, like I was saying about like land and like land access and getting farmers of color on land, the most important thing is the training that goes yeah. along with that and the education. And so like youth education that we're doing, but adult education too. So like people that actually want to get their hands dirty mm -hmm. on the farm, it's important that folks like come to Soul Fire or like build a model that we have at Soul Fire with the black and Latino farmer immersion mm -hmm. that teaches you all the different mm -hmm. aspects of like how to use a trail, how, how to use a tractor, how to build up your soil, but also how to reconnect to some of that history that is lost and like dealing with the trauma and actually like being with your people and like, it's like a therapy on the farm. And mm -hmm. so it's important to figure out how to build up those models because there there's training programs that the USDA, you know, provides, but there's not training programs that are like actually helping us get to those crux, you know, the crux of the matters for black and brown folks getting on land. So uh -huh. there's like, there's, there's issues missing in there. And, and how so, does it relate to the prison mm -hmm. project? Maybe both of you can talk about that, but the, the Victory The Victory Bus? bus. So Victory Bus is this project that um, one of our mentors is former Black Panther and he's currently in prison now. Um, and he wanted us to do these trips where you can bring families up and make sure they can like visit their families because that's a big deal, it was like transportation. Most people in prison are from the city and then most of the farms, or most of the prisons are in upstate New York. That's right. And so the transportation is a huge issue. There's not a lot of public transportation to a lot of the prisons. And so we're providing that, that gap right there, but we're also providing food from Soul Fire Farm and from different farms in the Hudson Valley and making sure we're, we're addressing both the issues. We're talking about food access, but we're talking about prison abolition mm -hmm. at the same time. And so, yeah. Talk about some of the people that you're working with. Can we give us a picture of a few of them? Well, okay, great. Uh, I work with young people. Um, the, you know, there's the, the uh, most of them are young men. Uh, we have a few uh, young women. Uh, most of them, uh, the demographic is uh, deep poverty. Mm -hmm. we, we're in the South Bronx. It's the poorest congressional district in the nation. Uh, the unemployment in certain census blocks is well over 50 percent. Um, this is greater than, it, uh, than the Depression uh, era where unemployment was at and poverty was at 25 percent. So we're talking about a, a, a situation of very, very deep intergenerational poverty. This is a state of oppression. Um, what that means for a young person growing up, it is not conducive at all. It's very destructive of, uh, during their personal growth and development years. Um, many young people are very hungry. So um, they get to school hungry. Um, you know, harking back to that, you, what we were alluding to before, you know, the breakfast program. So they're going to school hungry, teenagers, uh, they're angry. And so that's going to play itself out in schools. Teenagers are already uh, going through their adolescent angst. Mm -hmm. But, you know, imagine being hungry and, uh, and, and angry over a number of issues that are confronting you in your family situation. And you just have something um, that's uh, the perfect storm mm -hmm. for young people being uh, subject to police tactics in the schools. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the young people in my program, they're part of street families, uh, they're part of street organizations, otherwise pejoratively known as gangs, mm -hmm. uh, and these provide mutual support networks for the young people. But yes, because they're very, very, there's been this massive disinvestment uh, uh, in, in, in young people, they're, they're involved in, uh, my young people come from selling drugs, mm -hmm. you know, just to get, you know, swiping Metro cards, uh, snatching purses. Uh, doing, you know, being involved in turf wars. So what, what we do, you know, is with the food, one, we're getting food home. Uh, we're encouraging, you know, families to eat better. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, very appreciative because they don't have to spend all of that money to do so. So, uh, so this meaning. is really, this is really helping, helping the young people out tremendously. Older, meaning to yeah, so really. food plays a very strategic role in terms of uh, their, their being put at risk for being uh, arrested. And, and you know, the South Bronx has sometimes been referred to as a food desert, but it's really mm -hmm. not true. I mean, mm -hmm. you have Hunts Point, which is the yes. biggest transshipment point for food yes. across the entire, mm -hmm. well, the East Coast. Right. Yeah. So the there's country. not exactly a desert there. Mm -hmm. uh, do, ha no. How do you, t well, what, what, what language do you of, use One instead? of our, our colleagues, Karen Washington, she yeah. uses food apartheid. Mm -hmm. And so this is, there's food there, but the food is killing us. Mm -hmm. And there's laws that, you know, the access to the food. So there might be Hunts Point that doesn't, you know, serve the Bronx or serve any of our communities. 
Um, but there might be a Whole Foods in Manhattan, but it just doesn't serve our communities. Mm -hmm. And so how do we provide that access? How do we gain access? How do we grow our own food like Ray is doing? How do we do that for folks in Albany like Soulfire is doing and you know what other farms are doing? And can you yeah. bring it to scale? I mean, that's the question we ask all the time on this mm -hmm. program when we talk mm -hmm. about work around co-ops or different yeah. kinds, different mm -hmm. business initiatives like the ones you're talking about. Can you get it to scale so it's not just you know, a, f a few days out of a person's life or Absolutely. one meal in a blue um, so. One, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, structural racism when, we're, when you're dealing with the issue of scale. Uh, and what that means, you're talking about something that is uh, entrenched in terms of the governance. Uh, around the disposition of land resources. Um, there are policies such as FRESH, food retail initiatives uh, 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 for expansion to support health, food retail expansion to support health. But it's a big box, big box initiative that's looking to get more supermarkets in. Supermarkets do not want to come to the inner city, do not want to come to the Bronx. What we can do, we can do what I call micro food hub development. We can do the food production, we can do the processing, we can do the storage, the distribution, and the marketing mm -hmm. locally. What there is 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 this uh, uh, built up expectation that we're just consumers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we can be producers, we can be the marketers, we can actually, in addition to being consumers, and in the process, economically empower the community. Folks are not eating well because of poverty. Yeah. So how do we address that? Um, integrating, doing a vertical integration of the food system at the hyper-local neighborhood level. We can do this. Um, it's a battle. It's it? a policy battle. What do you need from government to do it? Hmm. Uh, we need uh, we need different people uh, on the planning commission, urban planning, the city planning. We uh, the city planning is basically made up of real estate development interests, and I don't want to say real estate is a bad thing, but the character of real estate development thus far in New York City has been very very predatory, very rapacious, uh, just profit driven, and it's just been gentrifying our neighborhoods and displacing our community, that uh, the indigenous community that's been there forever. So what we're saying, we need people on the planning commission that look like us, that uh, that reflect. Uh, on the planning commission needs to reflect the true uh, diversity and interests of everybody. So we need to be in there. For example, Pratt Institute here in Brooklyn had a project about a decommissioned women's prison right in this neighborhood, right, actually. On, on the West. Yes, exactly. And I was part of the consultation to that about how do we repurpose what was uh, something that was essentially an oppressive institution to mm -hmm. something that now is a regenerative opportunity for, for local community and that's responsive to the needs of the local community. So in terms of scale, the envelope is not being pushed. Right. And it's not being pushed because we're not at the table. That's a fundamental issue of structural racism. Yeah. If there are decisions being made by po folks in a air-conditioned bubble downtown in City Hall that's affecting us, that's a very ethical issue. If something is affecting us, then we need to have a say. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we, in the community, uh, through Freedom Food Alliance, through other initiatives such as the Peace and Justice Collective, and, and other grassroots-driven, neighborhood-driven uh, initiatives by communities of color where we're taking responsibility. So, uh, you know, there's mm. uh, but so much finger-pointing you can do. At some point in time, we have to take responsibility, and that's what we're doing with these initiatives that we're talking about. I was just about. to add to yeah. that, as far as, like, li farming <coughs> upstate and living upstate being the one, mm. you know, soul fires, a farm of color, I'm farming, I'm, like, one of the only other farmers of color. Um, and so how do you provide land access? Mm -hmm. You know, there's land that's available, um, and there was actually a bill through the state that was supposed to give young farmers um, land that the state had, you know, and one of those lands were like decommissioned prisons. And so the bill passed the House and the Senate, but then the governor vetoed the bill. And so that would have gave us access to free land, mm -hmm. you know, land that was under the state that wasn't being used, it was just sitting there um, that young farmers like myself and other folks could have had to actually, you know, grow food that would have been addressing some of these issues around food apartheid and, and access to land. And, and the grounds you know. for the veto? Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, is this? I think it's we want to put <laughs> casinos upstate yeah. New York, not m more farms or whatever it is. You know, but not something that is actually like regenerative yeah. economy that will actually support people. But it's something that is distracting, like prisons. And so, how do we do that? How do we use? Um, our, our collective responsibility to decommission prisons and, and build up more farms. Do you, yeah. do you have farming in your, in your family, in your history? Yeah, um, I mean, of course there's, there's history, but my dad is a farmer in Lancaster in Pennsylvania, and he's also a part of some of the work that we're doing. Um, he was, I didn't know him growing up, but when we met, 
um, it was it was magical because we were like actually doing the same thing. We're actually doing the same work, wow. working with young people, working with like food justice, environmental justice. And he has a plot called he has a program called Dig It, and he's doing restorative justice work. And now I'm trying to get him some some buses so he can do the prison trips. And he's going through the same thing where you know he works in a school and the young people that he work with, all their dads are in prison. Um, and he and he brings them to the farm and gives them away, you know, something something to look forward to. And he's basically their dad. So and you, yeah. right? Because our family hails from Puerto Rico, and there is basically an a, a, a general agrarian background. Mm -hmm. My dad, <clears throat> again, mm -hmm. uh, would take the seeds of the avocado and plant it in the windowsill. We grew up in public housing in uh, in, in East Harlem. And, you know, he would do things like that, you know, just to kind of something to remind him, if you will, because avocado really can't, you know, flourish in, in, uh, in a housing project windowsill. But that sort of thing is, I do remember those, those types of things. And it was your mom that bought the avocado. Our mom bought the avocado, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, she would make the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful salads. And just quickly on the, yeah. the role of the media, you know, this mm -hmm. question of urban farming has become very trendy. Mm -hmm. And New mm -hmm. York Magazine not so long ago had a whole series about your, your urban farmer. I think they were all white. Yes, you were. Uh, <laughs> urban farming on the rooftops, uh -huh. the stockbrokers, kids who decide to go farm. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. your story getting covered? Uh, yes, yeah. it, it is. I'm going to give you um, a great question, wonderful segue. We in the South Bronx have formed a pepper growing collective with a dozen community gardens. Uh, our friends of Brook Park U Farm is a part of that. We're growing peppers for a hot sauce company. The hot sauce company is called Bronx Hot Sauce. <laughs> Bronx Hot Sauce is being sold at Whole Foods. It's being sold at green markets like Union Square all over the city. It's being sold as far away as Seattle, Washington. And uh, uh, the Bronx Brewery has an IPA. You know, and so, so it's if being you so thought Brooklyn took over, just wait till you see what happens right, in the Bronx. Right, precisely. Yeah. So this is a wonderful model of, you, again, speaking to your original question around, aggregate, around scale, here we are aggregating a harvest. So here's a model for economic development. What we're doing out of Brook Park, the money is going into stipends for the young people. And so this is really a win, win, win. It's the triple bottom line. It's the social, the environmental, yeah. as well as the financial. Y you mentioned mm -hmm. early on, we'll close with this, you mentioned your inspiration being in part from a Black Panther. Yes, absolutely. Behind bars, Curtis mm -hmm. Muhammad, I think, if, if it's the same. Well, person. Herman Bell is one oh, of, was Bell. One of mm -hmm. our mentors as, you know, and his work was around the Victory Gardens project mm -hmm. where he like connected with farms in Maine and other organizations were bringing down. and. That's why we are named our bus project the Victory Bus Project and, and dedication to Herman, but also like it's a victory. We're claiming victory over all the injustice and you know, we look at it as a win win. You get a ride and some food. So yeah. Right. Herman Bell and Jalil Mukim and a number of other Black Panthers that have, you know, still locked in prison um, forty years later. You know, so I hope you yeah. get a chance to Update us on the story in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming well, in. Well, thank you. Thank you. You can get more information about these projects at our website. Check it out. It's not just on dry land that people are using farming to make a difference. Former cod fisherman Bren Smith is using kelp to build a more sustainable environment and keep jobs for fishermen. Patrick Mustang produced this report. At age 14, I dropped out of high school and headed out to sea. Wait, hold on. I was working at the height of industrialized fishing, so our boats were ripping up entire ecosystems with our trawls, using ever more efficient technologies to chase fewer and fewer fish further and further out to sea. The reason I shifted and sort of my, I, I adopted a different view of what was happening out in the ocean was that uh, while I was in the Bering Sea, the cod stocks crashed back in Newfoundland and then all, all up and down the East Coast. And that's when sort of the search for sustainability started. I had to figure out essentially a strategy of resiliency and adaptation to these new times. I 
found the work of Dr. Charlie Yarish at University of Connecticut, who's one of the world's experts on uh, growing seaweed. And, and I took a lot of his research and embedded it in my farm. And that's how we got to this sort of 3D model. Kelp are just very beautiful organisms. They have a lot of different uses besides being uh, important for uh, ecosystems and biological diversity. They also uh, have a very good economic value. It's a win-win, just imagine. It's a very effective carbon sink. Nitrogen is sequestered. Phosphorus is going to be sequestered there, and so we're doing something that's good for the environment. And also, you're producing a, a product, especially for human consumption, that really tastes good. What's happened over the years is my oysters and my seaweeds now have really um, taught me a lot about um, how we need to change our relationship to the oceans. There are elegant solutions out there. My job is to uh, figure out what Mother Nature has created already um, and grow those. So hundreds of millions of years ago, she created these two technologies that are stunning, that mitigate our harm in terms of climate change, in terms of overfishing, in terms of nitrogen pollution, a seaweed and shellfish. I use those technologies to help mitigate these you know, huge challenges we face. And also at the same time, you know, help, help create jobs and feed the feed the world Thanks to Patrick Mustaine for that field report for more on Brent Smith's kelp farm go to our website. During his historic address to Congress, Pope Francis called out Dorothy Day. In their scurry to figure out just why, reporters duly described Day as the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, which feeds and houses the urban poor. It may take Day being canonized to fill in the whole picture. She was also a pacifist, a radical journalist, a socialist, a single mom. Her life story would make for a great superhero movie, in fact. In the meantime, it's worth pointing out that decades before the crisis of today, Dorothy Day named our economy as the number one threat to the planet and people. And she proposed alternatives, not charity, but food power. It may be a sentimental notion, she wrote in 1925, but I think it would be wonderful to live entirely off the land and not depend on wages for livelihood, quote unquote. Famous for the shelters, she called them houses of hospitality, Day was clear that soup lines weren't the answer to poverty. The real step, she wrote, were farms. Inspired on a trip south to organize tenant farmers, she founded Mary Farm in northeast Pennsylvania in the 1930s, which she hoped would become the heart of her movement. The city's streets pulled her back, but her belief in farming stuck. I still think that the only solution is the land, Day wrote in 1957, and she remained committed to organizing, too. She was arrested with striking farm workers in California in the 1970s. As Thanksgiving rolls around and so many are struck so briefly with the urge to do something for the hungry, it's worth remembering that at least as far as Dorothy Day was concerned, it's not food pantries that will change things. It's workers with rights, autonomy, and food power. To tell me what you think, write to laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. Black land matters this week on the Laura Flanders Show. There's always been a backstory of mm. cooperative financial movements behind those social movements. And then we take a look at a few initiatives to do that again today. What this workshop does specifically in breaking down what a cooperative does is empowers people. That is where I kind of lay most of my hope for, for change in this neighborhood. 
week on the Laura Flanders Show, Hamid Khan. Counterterrorism and counterinsurgency policies and programs have been increasingly incorporated and codified into domestic policing. And then come back to New York to meet the students that persuaded Columbia University to divest from private prisons. It's one tactic that's a part of a much broader movement. We know, we saw, we watched